to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, if you've not done so already. We'll read the first four, five, six verses together. And then I want to do something with you. I'm going to take you in the theater of your mind back to this whole event. I'm going to use that passage in John chapter 14, verse 1 through 6, to set up. It's kind of the central theme of everything before it and everything after it. As I take you in the theater of your mind, just dramatically um, explaining and putting ourselves there. I want you to feel it. I want you to hear. Now, I want to be honest with you. I will stick right by the scriptures, of course. But I will add some conversation that's not here. I will speak some scriptures that are not quoted here by name and number. But everything I'm going to say is scriptural and is either alluded to in these scriptures that those things were said or could have been easily said by those that were in that room that night. So I just wanted you to know that. I just wanted to fill it full to give you a perspective, to give you the context for this whole evening. And these beautifully famous words that we quote that come right from here, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. But I want to give you a deeper understanding and context of how brokenhearted he was when he said it, yet how encouraging he was too. And then I will pull the bow together and make it very relevant to all of us, okay? So I do ask that you would double check your cell phones, please, because I don't need that going off while I'm trying to do this. And, um, and I pray the Lord will use this for you, okay? The Gospel of John, chapter 14, it makes up a five-chapter section that describes the details of that Last Supper. Begins in chapter 13, continues in chapter 14, where we are, goes to 15, 16, 17, and then chapter 18. They're headed to Gethsemane. They're headed eventually to Caiaphas' home, then to Pilate's headquarters, the governor. Then before the crowd where they cry out for Barabbas and they cry out, crucify him. Then we're headed to Calvary's cross. Then three days later, we're standing at the tomb through the scriptures in our mind's eye, feeling the utter shock of even his closest disciples. They couldn't quite wrap their heads around the fact that this was real, this was literal, until they saw it. And even then, some of them didn't believe until they touched the nail prints in his hand and the spear wound in his side. I mean, this shook the world, beginning with that little part of the world, but all the way up 2,000 years later. It's still shaking the world. So I want you to understand this. Look at John chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. We're going to kind of come in in the middle of it. Jesus is going to say something, and the context is pretty clear, and we understand these words, but I'll make it a little clearer in a moment. John 14. Jesus stands and he says to his disciples that night, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God. Trust also in me. Now in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And you know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, Thomas, I am the way, 
and the truth and the life. I am. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, before I get into the uh, presentation of it, I wanted to hit back in my Father's house or many dwelling places. That is the exact Greek word, skene, and it, it's also interpreted, if you put it in English from the Hebrew, tabernacles. There are many tabernacles, many dwelling places. The and he said, so I'm going to go prepare a place for you. That's a different Greek word, but it attaches to that. It means I'm going to prepare a whole region for you in which you will dwell with me forever and in which you will minister a kingdom of priests. <laughs> Sometimes we make God way too small and we don't know what we don't know. That's why the Apostle Paul, who got a taste of it, who was caught up to paradise long before John, almost 30 years before John was caught up and then gave us the book of Revelation, Paul said, I can tell you what, your mind cannot comprehend. Your eyes have never seen. Your ears have never heard. And this is what God has in store for those that love him. So when you read these words, I know in the King James it says many mansions, and that's okay. It's, it's kind of an unfortunate translation in that it's way more than a, a big pretty house that we think somehow we deserve. <laughs> we got that entitlement mentality, right? Well, I served you. I put money in the offering plate, and I said your name. I want my mansion. It's so much bigger than that. I just, just want you to get it in your, in your head. It's so much bigger than that. Let's go back now. Some time back before this, Jesus had been in Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Mary and Martha had summoned him, had called him, had begged him to come because their brother had grown very sick. And they sent word to Jesus while he was still alive. But Jesus was a day and a half journey away, but he purposely waited to arrive there on the fourth day, the fourth day of his death. We know what happened with Lazarus. The reason Jesus waited four days, we know that now. Because three days, decay of the body sets in in that ancient culture. Three days. So by waiting to the fourth day, he understood. We all, we, sometimes we almost laugh, and it's kind of a morbid laugh when Mary says, when he says, roll back the stone, he says, she says, don't do that. He stinks. You know, we kind of laugh. But, but to them, that was very important. It was like a desecration of the dead because decay had set in, and they knew that. And what Jesus did on purpose was to let them know, you're not going to see a trick you're getting ready to see an impossibility, humanly speaking. A decaying body, corpse, will walk out of that grave alive right before your eyes. Now, the Bible says that there were also Jewish elite rabbis, Pharisees up in that region. They had business up there, and there were synagogues around, and some of them had been a part of those synagogues, and so they were up there, and they knew the whole Jesus event was going on, and they knew it was getting close to Passover, and more than likely Yeshua would come. They knew that they were good friends with Yeshua, and they were wanting to find out more and more about him. So they were there as well, which is exactly what Jesus had planned. He wanted them to see it. So before this event, some days before, Jesus had been up on the Mount of Olives. Oh, Bethany, a mile and a half, two miles from the eastern gate of Jerusalem. An hour's walk or so. Some of it was uphill, so. Some of it was downhill. But close, in those days, that was a close. For us, we'd die if we couldn't get in a car to drive two miles. I mean, what, I'm going to walk? That's two miles. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, well... Shame on you. 
but they walked everywhere they went. And so we know what happened there. Jesus wanted to see the place where Lazarus had been laid. So they took him out just in respect of him. They were the two sisters, of course, were speaking words of disappointment. I want to say anger. It wasn't really anger. It was just disappointment. If you had been here, you could have healed him before he died. It was the whole purpose of him being there four days later. He wanted to show them death is not the final answer when you're with me. Amen? Death is not the final answer when you're with me. So, of course, we know what he did. He stepped up. They were showing him, here's the, here's the tomb, here's the cemetery. It, it's beautiful. We're, we're going to have some flowers around it later. And he says, roll back the stone. They said, what? Well, of course, you know what happened then. He said, look, do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Do you, do you believe? Do you believe that the dead that are, who are in the Lord will live again? Oh, we believe in, in the last days. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. I am the resurrection and the life. They still didn't understand. He said, roll back the stone. They said, he's decaying now. It will be disrespectful. It, it, it'll smell bad. He said, do what I ask you to. They started rolling back the stone. They get it just big enough for a human to come through or a human to go into. And Jesus looks, tears streaming down his cheeks. Lazarus, come forth. I mean, we know the rest of the story, so we get excited by that. But surely they had to go, he's lost his mind. He's lost his ever-loving mind. And within moments, they heard and they saw bustling around inside of the darkness until finally Lazarus stepped forth, wrapped up in his grave clothes, cloths, bound up. He begins to walk out, and Jesus said, loose him. People hit their knees. Some wept out loud. They crowded in on him. The religious leader said, oh, my gosh, we're dealing with something far bigger than what we thought. I know what. Let's kill him. And later, they plotted to kill Lazarus, too, because he was the evidence that would be before the world. And this whole thing was witnessed by a ton of people, including religious elites and his followers, and some who weren't his followers, but were friends of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It was in a town. It was at the cemetery. People had come streaming out with them. What are we going to do with this? That's the backdrop. Just days later, Jesus would ride in at the beginning of the Feast of Passover and unleavened bread. It would end in the Feast of First Fruits. Jesus rides in on the back of a foal of a donkey. That was all symbolic. It comes out of Zechariah chapter 4. It was symbolic of the entrance of a king through the eastern gate. And it was also a prophecy of the Messiah that would come to Israel, first to Israel, and he would come that way on the back of a donkey through the eastern gate. That's what he does. Well, the crowds are already in. Jerusalem because it's it's Passover. People came from all over the empire, those that could travel long distances, and they did, and those that could walk there did, even if it was three, four, five, six, seven days of walking. 
they would come for that great feast, for that great celebration. It was all a celebration of how God had delivered his people out of slavery of over 400 years in Egypt. It was a celebration of all of that and so much more. They had not yet made the connection between the Lamb of Passover and Exodus 12. And taking the blood of the Lamb and putting it over the door in the shape of a cross at the top and at the sides and from the basin below from where the Lamb was slaughtered for this threshold covenant. I know Zeph was listening. He wrote a book about this called Blood Alliance. It is absolutely astounding. You've got to get it. They hadn't made that connection yet about Passover, but Jesus it was all about him. He knew it from the beginning. He's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He was there doing what he had come to do. Even his closest disciples had yet to entirely wrap their head around it. You're going to hear in just a moment. You heard some of it just a second ago, but you're going to hear in a moment. Here's Jesus claiming, I am the way. In other words, I am the door. He said that many times. I am the door. You got to come through me, and I am the door that's got the blood all over it in the shape of a cross, and you have to come through me under the blood of the cross. And then you too can have eternal life and be restored to the glory that God intended for you to have before Satan mucked it up. Well, so Jesus comes in on the back of the donkey. The throngs come down to meet. They throw their cloaks in the ground in front and palm branches, all a sign of submission to the king. The religious elite gathered. They saw the throngs of people and they were filled with further rage and jealousy. They'd be lucky to attract a hundred or more people to their synagogues. And now here were thousands, maybe tens of thousands, pouring to the eastern gate, lining the streets to meet this carpenter's son from Nazareth. That's how they often referred to him. You're just the son of a carpenter. Who are you? You didn't even go to our seminaries. You have not even been promoted through the ranks of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin council until just a few years ago didn't even know you. And here he is with thousands, maybe 10,000, maybe more thousands lining the streets saying, Halel, Halel, Ben David. Hail, hail to the son of David, which is a term out of the Old Testament, meaning the Messiah who was to come. The Pharisees rushed to his donkey in the middle of the crowd, breaking their way through. And they said, tell your disciples to shut up. Tell these people to shut up. This is blasphemy. He said, I could do that. Inference being, but I won't. Because even if I did, the rocks would cry out. All creation is groaning. So he kept going. Well, for the next several days, he would be in the temple courts preaching and teaching. And those scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and the Sanhedrin council and the temple guard and the Herodians, the political religious party that supported King Herod, the puppet Jew of the Roman Empire, the puppet Jewish king, they all came and he would be teaching to thousands in the courts of Solomon up at the Temple Mount. And those religious elite would come, they would mock him, they would ridicule him, they would ask him questions trying to get him caught in tricks. They would harass him while he was speaking. The people were afraid to say anything, they were terrified of the religious elite. But this one that was speaking, they had heard about him or seen him or had been with him in certain situations, even at the Sermon on the Mount in the beginning of his ministry. Some of them were there when he fed the 10,000 with his word. So they're there that day, but they're terrified of the religious elite because they had all kinds of rules. If you, if you, and this is in the scriptures, he's, but if you point to Jesus and call him the Messiah, 
you are kicked out of the synagogue for life. Now, that was important back then. I know some of us are saying, well, big deal. What's the big deal with that? Get on with life. The synagogue was the life of the Jews in the Roman Empire. That was where their schools were held. That was where their library was. That was a recreational center. It's where they did services for funerals and weddings and bar mitzvahs. And I mean, to get kicked out of that means you're kicked out of your culture, your people. It was one of the ultimate insults, one of the ultimate punishments. That's why they remained largely quiet. For several days that went on. Finally, it came the day of preparation, the time to get ready for the Passover meal. You don't have to turn there, but John 13 opens with that, where they come into this upper room in downtown Jerusalem that had been prepared in advance. So they meet kind of in secret. They go up to this place, and they sit down, and they begin to eat. Oh, scriptures are quoted, songs are sung, a lot of joviality takes place, some dancing. It's just a time of celebration, being, being freed from captivity in Egypt and brought into the promised land to be a new nation. And so they were celebrating all of that in all of their various ways. A lot of talk around the table. It was Jesus and the 12 for sure. Maybe some of the women disciples, some of the other fringe, fringe disciples, but it, we, we know at least those were there. And they're celebrating. They're having a good time. They're around the table talking, and some of them are down at the other end are singing some songs, and some of the others are clapping to the beat and singing with them and talking and leaning into each other and talking. At which point Jesus announced, probably didn't scream it, he just said it in the midst of everything that was happening as they're beginning to eat. One of you here will betray me. As the scriptures proclaimed, the one who breaks bread with me will lift his heel against me. And they went back. Some of them heard what he said. Some of them didn't. Some of them were singing at the other end. and they got, But a few heard. The meal and the celebration continued. Peter is sitting next to John. Peter nudges John. He says, uh, man, you're sitting right next to him asking who he's talking about. You know, they had no idea who it was. They had no idea who it was that would betray. It, they, John, Peter knew it wasn't him. John knew it wasn't him. They probably went through the others in their mind. They got to Judas. They didn't even begin to think it was him. He was the treasurer. He was the trusted keeper of all of their riches. He's a nice guy. But evil was in his heart. And it had been. He was disappointed in Jesus because he just knew that somehow Jesus was going to overthrow the Roman Empire and establish a new government. It was going to be a coup. And he wanted to be an important figure in it. He had it all wrong because his heart was all wrong. The empire that Jesus is going to create, way bigger than that. It's a universe. He created the universe. It's that. It's the restoration of what we know as the Garden of Eden. Perfection. No more death. No more crying. No more pain. No more mourning. The old order of things will be passed away. Revelation chapter 21. That's what he had come for. But first he had to go to Golgotha. So Peter leans into John and says, you're sitting next to him, ask him, who, what, what is he talking about? He's always saying such hard things, things we don't understand, things that, how can it be? John looked at Peter and said, got it. He leaned in, leaned in, Lord, who are you talking about? Who would betray you? We are the ones that love you. And Jesus looked at John in a low voice and said, I'm going to dip my bread into the olive oil. 
I'm going to dip a piece and I'm going to hand it to the man that will betray me. That's how you will know. I'm sure John turned back and whispered it to Peter, but right now only three people in the room knew who it was going to be. After he'd said that to John, he tore off a piece of bread. Everyone was eating. He dipped it. He had already served several others. He dipped it in the oil, and he handed it to Judas. John's jaw dropped open. Peter, well, he must be mistaken, not Judas. Why would you trust him with the whole our whole livelihood if he's going to betray what are you talking about while he was saying that Judas had the bread in his mouth and Jesus looked at him and said in front of all the disciples what you're going to do do it now and do it quickly Judas looked at him with that who me kind of look <laughs> Jesus just looked at him right into Judas's soul. And Judas felt it. But he knew what he was going to do. He went up and he left. He went to the Jewish religious elite. They had already offered him money. Lots of it. If he would betray Jesus' location to them that night so they could arrest him in secret, and get him before Pilate and kill him. Imagine that. The religious elite, the righteous ones, plotting murder of two people unashamedly. Jesus and Lazarus himself. So Judas got up and left. None of the disciples even thought that he would be the betrayer. They thought that they, his, the scripture says this, that Jesus had told him to go because there were things that still needed to be gotten, some business dealings that needed to be shored up before Passover really got deeply underway and before the Sabbath came. He was that trusted by the disciples. They didn't even think. John knew. Peter knew. Peter was livid, especially when Judas got up to leave. After Judas had left, though, Jesus did something that further floored them. Most of the frivolity and the joviality is still going on because that's but that it's a celebration. It's like our Thanksgiving meals, if you will. So the singing continued and the joke telling continued, and then later on, when it became more formal, scriptures were read and prayers were made and some more dancing around the room. Somebody played an instrument. And, but in the middle of that, while all that was going on, Jesus got up from the table. The meal lasts a long time. You just get up and down during the meal and have your little fun and then go back and eat. And not only the meal, but there's finger food everywhere. So it was a party. Jesus gets up in the middle of all of it. He takes off his outer garments. That's like if I took my suit off. It doesn't mean he stripped down to nothing. It's just, you know, to take. he took his suit and tie off and laid it down. He went over to the doorway where there was a basin of water where normally slaves or servants of the very rich were required to wash the feet of the people that came in because most people, you know, they didn't have shoes and Boots. Like, uh, most of them were sandals or barefoot. And so at the end of a long day, when you came into the house, one of the most refreshing things you could do is have your feet washed. Now, people that didn't have slaves and servants, they washed their own. And there was a towel rack there, and but a big basin. You'd come at least stick your feet in it and kind of slosh them around a little bit, wash them a little bit if you wanted. But you know, if you've ever had nasty, dirty, crusty, scaly feet from walking around all day long, you know that just washing your feet, it's almost like your whole body feels clean. I mean, you feel refreshed. You're ready to sit down. You wouldn't want to sit down at the table and eat with crusty, nasty, dirty feet. But you clean them all off, and you feel like, hey, I'm ready to eat now. That's what it was all about. They had all 
kind of washed their feet when they came in. On their own, like was typical. They weren't rich. But now Jesus gets up and he takes his suit off, let's say. He takes a towel off the rack and he wraps it around his waist. And he says, I need everyone's attention. And so everything died down and all eyes were on him. He took the basin and he knelt at one of his disciples' feet. And he took the feet and put it in the pan and they all looked on with a little bit of horror. It's like, oh my gosh, this is our rabbi. This is the good teacher. This is the one that people are just hailed the son of David. This is Messiah. And he's washing our feet like a slave, like a servant. This is unbelievable. So he begins to do this. He comes to Peter's feet, and Peter, he's aghast. He says, you, you're not going to wash my feet, Lord. I need to be washing your feet. I, I, I will never let you wash my feet. He says, if I don't wash your feet, then you will not be clean, and you can have no part with me if you're not clean. At which point, Peter, probably making a joke, making himself feel better, <laughs> well, then wash my whole body. I bet Jesus smiled, probably even laughed, although this was a somber occasion, because as he continued doing it, he looked at Peter and he said, soon you will understand why I did this. Well, I'm just going to tell you, they did understand. A little bit later on, they got it. First of all, Jesus is their master. They would call him that, master, or Adon, or Adonai, Lord. Um, he's doing the work of a slave. He's teaching them about serving others. He's teaching them about humbling yourself to minister to your brother or sister. He's doing that. But more importantly, as Brother Zev taught us a long time ago, and we've preached it and taught it a lot from this pulpit ever since, he was fulfilling Exodus 29 and Leviticus chapter 8. Exodus 29, 4 and Leviticus 8, 6, where the instructions are being given to the high priest. Well, guess who Jesus is? The rest, of the, the rest of the New Testament tells us over and over, he is the high priest of the universe. He is our great high priest. But the high priest, way back in the day, when they were ordaining new priests into the ministry with them, they washed their feet. And then there was a ritualistic washing of their entire body. Jesus, the great high priest of the universe, the creator of the universe, the same one that stooped in the dirt of the earth he created, formed up the dirt and the dust and made clay and brought forth Adam and then later Eve. That same kneeling one on his feet now, ordaining them into the ministry of the priesthood. They were the ones that would be the pastors and leaders of the first church that would then take the gospel to the world, that would bring us to this building on a Lord's Day morning and worship and sing and praise. They were the initial priests of the kingdom of God. They were the ambassadors that started the whole thing. Amen. And he was in ordaining them into the priesthood, the great high priest. You can give the Lord a hand of praise. So after that, Jesus begins to kind of cryptically again, although he'd said it flat out several times, but begins to tell them why he had come. And that soon he would be handed over to the Jews and would be betrayed by the crowds. Peter speaks up again because, you know, he's the all-knowing one, the wise one. I will never betray you. I will never turn back from you. I will never deny your name. Jesus looked at him. I'm sure he had a 
broken heart when he said it. Peter, this is going to be a long night. And before this night is over and before the sun breaks in the morning, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times this very night. I don't know what Peter said. I'm sure he stomped his foot and said, never. But we know the rest of the story. And it was in the middle of that conversation when the disciples were saddened, they were confused. By the way, where's Judas? When's he coming back? Jesus sent him on an errand. There's a betrayer here. Who is the one that's going to betray? Maybe he had just identified Peter as the one. You will deny me three times. You will deny me three times before the morning. It, all of that stuff was going on. And Jesus spoke then and said, Let not your hearts be troubled over any of this. You believe in God? Believe in me. I know what I'm doing. Bereshit Seha Elohim from the beginning, in the beginning, the Lamb of God. That's me. You believe in God, believe also in me. And in my Father's house are many tabernacles. I'm going to prepare an entire region for you. And you know where I'm going. And you know how to find that way. What Jesus was saying is, I am poretz derech. I am the one that makes the way for you to come to me. I am the way maker. I am the kicker down of doors. I'm the breaker of chains. I am poretz derech. You know. Thomas, he has a nickname that's lasted 2,000 years. Doubting Thomas. He steps up. Now it's his turn to play Peter. <laughs> What are you talking about? We don't know the way. We don't have a clue what you're talking about. What way are you talking about? What, what, we, we don't understand. And Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way. Have you not understood this yet? I am the truth, Thomas. I am the life. Now, Thomas, listen to me. I'm not just another way of life. I am the way. I'm not just another truth that adds to the world's truth. I am the truth, the true truth, the perfect truth. And Thomas, I am the life. You saw me speak to a dead man for Four days he'd been dead, and you heard my voice, and you saw what happened. I am the one that gives life. Kae olam, I am the one. Hamotzi kae olam, I am the one who gives eternal life. Only me. Do you not understand this, Thomas? After all these years. Now it's Philip's turn. He's going to be a little more diplomatic. Because, you know, Peter and Thomas, Peter's a doubter and, you know, and double-minded. Peter's got a big mouth and raging emotions at all times. So Philip steps forward and basically looks at other guys. I'll handle this. Y'all can trust me. Adon, Lord. Oh, Lord. If you, if you could just show us, please, please, Lord, don't, don't, don't think ill of me. But if you could, if you could show us the Father, if you could give us a vision, if you could fill this room with his throne, if you could, if the veil could be peeled back and we could see his face, if you could just show us the Father, 
could you show us the Father? Then, then we would believe. Then we would get it. You know what he sounded like? He sounded like the Jews that were constantly saying, show us a sign from heaven. Open up the heavens before us. Show us the Father. I mean, he thought he was going to fix the whole situation. He just made it worse. Show us the Father. To which, and this is the part of the message I couldn't wait to get to. To which, Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you so long and you still don't know who I am? I'll just say it one more time, Philip. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. And what you wanted to see, you're looking at it now. Philip, disciples, sit down. Before this night is over, it's going to be a long night. Before tomorrow comes, you've got to hear this. Disciples, sit down. Philip, you're looking at the embodiment of the Father. You're looking at the Word that has become flesh that was with God and was God from the beginning. And now I am here in the flesh. Now, Philip and the rest of you, before you ask this question again, and please don't, I want you to think of this. You all were brought up in synagogue. You all know the scriptures, at least at that level. And here's what you should know. Job 9, Psalm 77, Psalm 107, Proverbs 30. All of them say, Philip, listen, only God can walk on the water. Only God can speak to the wind and the waves and they obey him. Only God can calm a storm with his voice. Only Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim, El Shaddai can do such a thing. Weren't you in the boat that night, Philip? When a storm raged and I was sleeping? And you got up screaming like a bunch of little girls. We're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. And I stood in the back of the boat, raised my hand and said, peace, be still. And the whole storm went. And you said, Philip, who is this that even speaks to the wind and the waves and they obey him? And you asked me to show you the Father, Philip? Or how about the night I came to you in another storm, walking on top of the water? Peter, do you remember anything about that night? Amen. Here's Peter. If it's you, Lord, they thought it was a ghost. I, I mean, if we were there at that point in time in life, we would have thought the same thing. You certainly wouldn't think, oh, there's Jesus walking on the water again, <laughs> dog. <laughs> Come on, Lord, get in the boat with us. That's not what they thought. One of the disciples saw it, but he was ashamed to say anything because he thought he was having a nightmare or something, so he didn't. And then another one said, look, and another one said, look, and finally the first one said, I, I'm so glad y'all see this too. And Jesus spoke. Do you not remember, Philip? Do you not remember, Peter? When I cried out, it is I. Fear not. Peter, remember what you said? Well, yeah, Lord, I'm a little embarrassed to tell it now, but say it, Peter. What did you say? I said, if it is you, then let me come walk to you on the water too. And you said, 
come. And I went. Peter said, what happened next, Peter? Remind the whole room. They all saw it, but apparently you guys have a memory the size of a gnat. <laughs> Peter, what happened? I walked on the water with you until I took my eyes off of you and put them on the wind and the waves, and I began to sink. And what happened then, Peter? And you saved me. You pulled me up from the watery depths. You and you alone. Okay, guys. Philip, you asked me, show me the Father. I'm saying, you're looking at him. But it doesn't end there, Philip. Over and over in the Psalms and in Isaiah, guys, the Word of God, the Tanakh in Hebrew, he would have said, the Tanakh says in the Law and the Prophets, No one can open the eyes of the blind. No one can open the eyes of a blind man or woman or child with a word except God himself. Amen. Six times over the last three years, I have opened the eyes of blind right in front of you. In fact, some of you almost made a carnival show out of it. He's getting ready to do it again. Y'all gather around. Right, guys? Well, you know, Lord, we didn't really, we, you know, it was just, it was cool. I mean, people came and, yeah. But only God can do that, right? Isn't that what the scriptures say, disciples? Yes, Lord. How about the time I opened the eyes of a man born blind? By the time we get to him as an adult, he doesn't even have eyeballs in his sockets. They're scarred over. What did I do? Peter speaks up. You made him see. Wow, Peter, that's deep. <laughs> Philip, you wanted to see the father. What did I do? You spit in the dirt and made mud. You mean like this? And you put it on his eyes. And he could see his whole life was different. His Peter, I'm on my knees. Something's happening here. What does this remind you of as I remind you of that day? It reminds me, Lord, of when God, it, you, <laughs> call forth Adam from clay and dirt and breathed into him life. There might be hope for you yet, Peter. And what did you see on his face after I had done that? We saw eyeballs, seeing eyeballs. You mean I created something out of nothing with a word? Who can do that? Disciples, Philip, who can do that? I want Philip to answer. Who alone can create something out of nothing and then bring it alive? Only the Father can do that. Who can take a little boy's lunch of fish and bread and have 10,000 plus people sit on the grass and then we fill baskets with little pieces of it. And at my word, I tell you to take it to the people. And the baskets begin to overflow in front of 
thousand witnesses. And then you take up seven baskets left over. And all the people go back to all the regions and tell everybody about it. And there were Jewish elite, religious elite in the crowd spying on us. Who can do that? Have you ever heard of such a thing? Have you ever seen it before? Have you seen it since? Will you think you'll ever see it again? Who alone can take little something? Or actually, he didn't even need what the boy brought. You know, the Lord doesn't need our money. He wants to bless our offering like little children bringing palm prints and clay to mommy on Mother's Day. To the world, that's worthless and useless. To that mom, it's everything. That's what the little boy's lunch was about. It wasn't about him needing something to start with. He spoke it and brought it. Jesus said, Philip, who can do that? Only the Father can, Lord. Guys, you've been with me for three years. How many times have I spoken a word and a dead person came back to life in front of your eyes? Three. Interesting number, Philip. Three. Three times, and the last one was Lazarus. A man that we've all known from the beginning of my ministry. Who can speak life back into a dead body? Who can recreate a body and make it whole again with a word? Have you ever seen a rabbi do that, Philip? Thomas? Peter? John? Have you ever seen any miracle worker do anything like that ever? They all just stood looking at the ground now. They didn't know what to say. And he said, who alone can take nothing, turn it into something, and speak a word, and give a breath, and it lives? What does the Tanakh say, fellas? Only Father God can do that. What did you see with your eyes, gentlemen? Who can make the lame to walk and leap like deer with just a word? Who can take a leprous person, body riddled with leprosy, a terminal, filthy, horrible disease, especially in that day, making them immediate outcasts of whole society, including their own family. They would never touch their child again or their wife or their husband or grandchildren. Never. They have to live outside the camp. Who can take a person like that and say, be healed. Now go show yourself to the priests and tell them who did this. Who can do that with a word? And you saw it with your eyes, gentlemen, several times. Only the Father. I'll say it again, gentlemen. If you have seen me, you have seen by your own mouth, you have seen the Father. Amen. Guys, y'all listen to me. Our culture is eaten up with visitations from green men from other planets. Our Congress has secret committees. We had a senator 
Burkett or Burchett, I don't know how he pronounces his name, a senator who was on that secret committee came out afterwards and in the headlines of the news, here was his declaration. They're here. They're bigger than us, stronger than us. We don't know what to do. We just hope they're benevolent because they can turn us into ash. I've been in committee hearings. I've heard the testimony. I've heard the whistleblowers. We've seen the videos. We see what we're up against. They're here. They're speaking of a coming visitation. I, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a ufologist. I'm, I can read. Imagine that. But I don't believe 80% of what I read because we are living in a land of deception and tricks and mind games. Just like the Word of God said, and listen to me, and only the Word of God. There's no other religious book on the planet that speaks of the last days being filled with this kind of wicked, demonic deception and visitations. Well, where does it say visitations? Paul talked about doctrines of demons. Beware. Satan will present himself like an angel of light. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, it'll be just like the days of Noah, just like the days of Lot. What happened? The sons of God came unto the daughters of men. In the days of Noah, God had to push the reset button. Angels visited Abraham, God himself in the flesh. That would be what we would now call Yeshua. A Christology, it's called. When you see that in the Old Testament, God knows how to put on flesh. He created flesh. Well, how can he change the elements? He created the elements. How can he defy the wind and the waves? He created the wind and the waves. How can he walk on water? It's like you and me walking down a sidewalk. We poured the sidewalk. We can do it. He did it. Our God is too small sometimes in our minds. We make him just a big man floating around in space and got a baseball bat to beat people over the head that aren't obeying him and has a field of tulips that we can walk through for those of us that love him. That's about the end of it. Well, I come to church and I do some good things. I put a little money in the offering plate every now and then. I tell the preacher I love him, so I'm going to heaven. I know, no, you guys don't say anything like that. And certainly people wouldn't say those kinds of things out loud, but... I know I've had conversations with people where some of those things have literally been said to me with a straight face. And it's not about any of that. It is about, Peter, who do people say I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Others say you're Elijah the prophet that's appeared on the face of the earth. Some say you're the greatest teacher they've ever seen. Well, stop, Peter. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Peter, upon that declaration, I will build my church. Peter would be the first senior pastor of the first church. Peter. The one in the upper room that said, I will never deny you. And before that night was over, three times in the presence of a teenage Roman girl. Aren't you? You're one of them. You're with them. They've got him in there with Caiaphas. Aren't you one of them? I never knew the guy. Scared of a girl. Three times. Some translations say denied him with a curse. I never knew the blankety blank guy. Guys, listen to me. Here's our culture. Well, this bunch of fairy tales and stories is made up by men. Except we've got 10,000 copies that are tied to the originals to the first 100 years of the New Testament documents alone. Now we've got the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've got entire books from this scripture, all of them saying and all of them agreeing together. A few little variances here and there, but nothing major and hardly any at all. And we now know that the Word of God is living and it has endured all ages and all attempts to destroy it. And it's got the same message. And we know 
that this message changed the world. The calendars to this day still scream the Christ event 2024. Every time an atheist signs their check, they're saying 2,024 years ago, the Christ event took place that rocked the world because not only did he deliver himself to a cross, not only did he come out of a grave, and not only was it three days later, but for 40 days and 40 nights, he appeared to hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands. One passage of scripture tells us Paul's preaching to people that saw it. He said, and he appeared to over 500 of you at once, of you at once. He said, some are dead. Some of you are dead now over that. I mean, in, in that time period, but that was just at one meeting. It changed the world, guys. Revelation 12, which is a part of all of that, actually says, and in the last days, woe unto you, earth, because Satan is filled with rage. He is going to attack. He's going to unleash his wrath on the woman that brought forth the Christ. And that woman is representative of Israel, which is now back in the Middle East. And look at the world. Satan has filled his rulers, his leaders with a hate for the Jewish people and for Israel. He's attacking, he's attacking, he's attacking. Only one book in the world says that would happen and names the nations, Persia, Iran, that would be one of the great leaders of it, doing it. We're living in the midst of it and you seldom, it's seldom preached from pulpits. And most Christians don't even know. And if you try to tell them, they think you're a conspiracy theorist. Yet the word of God's been saying it for 2,800 years before it happened. And we're the first generation to live in it. Well, I wish, you know, God would show us things like, you know, he did back then. I just named one. And then I name two because I'm talking about the alliance of nations that's in Ezekiel 38. And then I'm talking about Daniel chapter 12 and Matthew 24 when Jesus said and Daniel said, and not these words, but I've proven to you before, that's exactly what they said. There will be an exponential explosion of technology in the last days that will mark the time. In fact, one of the little cryptic things that Jesus said, because he's talking from Daniel chapter 12 all through Matthew 24. He's quoting parts of Daniel 12. And then he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be being preached to all the nations of the world in those days. And that's when the end is coming. We're the first generation to have the technology of 24-7 communication information services. The gospel is going to the entire world, even right now from this little pulpit, from this little preacher, from this little church, all over the world, even into Israel and all over the world. We're just one. You can get on Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, whatever, TikTok, TikTok. Whatever you want, you can put scriptures, you can give a word of, of, of goodness, you can put a segment of a sermon or something, and you can send it, and millions of people before the day is over could hear it. It'll get shared all over and keep going, and sometimes you don't even know you've got that. You say, well, on my Facebook side, I've only got 50 hits, but you don't know who's pulled that down and put it elsewhere all over. That's happened to me many times. Just little things I put up there. I have people call me and say, you need to go to TikTok. You need to go over here. You need to go over there. They got a, you got a million views on that. Well, they took my video down and put it. And I don't care. I don't care. A lot of people get all mad. You're violating my copyright. I don't have copyright. It's the word of God. <laughs> well, well, what is that? Just one little measly person? And I'm just one. I'm using myself. But a lot of you do it too. We're living what Jesus said would happen. And he said, and then the end will come. I'm talking about we're living the most prophetic times. Guys, well, you know, but Jesus was there. He fed the 10,000. He did this. He did that. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right up till he went to the cross, they still didn't understand it. Or they forgot it. Or they had turned it into, man, look how great we are. We're with this guy who can work magic tricks. They can call it that. Miracles. It's unbelievable. We've never seen anything like that. Hey, y'all line up. He's getting, he's getting open eyes of another blind man. Y'all come now. Him. Peter, go get the Kentucky Fried Chicken buckets. We can make some money off this. Of course, I'm being funny, but I mean, you know, we're humans, right? We've, they were with him right up to the last. Think about it. Think about things that have been shown right here. 
I've preached all through the seven feasts. We're going to do it again. This coming Thursday starts the Feast of Trumpets. If I said, what does that represent, and ask for a show of hands, I doubt if there would be many. I'm not talking down to you. I'm saying human nature. I've preached through. I've, I've asked groups of people from time to time, just in Bible studies and stuff and Sunday nights and stuff, just came in and said, where can we find the seven feasts and what do they mean? And, how, and very few know, but I've preached it about 85 times. Jesus now, I'm not comparing myself to Jesus, but I mean, that's what he's talking about. Guys, you were with me. You were with me when I walked on the water. You were with me when I calmed the storm. You have been taught over and over in your synagogues that only God can do that. And now you ask me to show you God? You hear what I'm saying? Amen. It's the word of God. It's not Carl Gallup's. It's not a priest or a preacher. It's the word of God that's screaming to us. And then the things that are only happening in our day. How about the videos I showed you of the DNA inner workings and the tens of thousands of, of but the little molecular motors. Think about arms and legs and feet. They step around each other and walk up and down the strands. And it's all happening at the speed of a jet engine trillions of times a day, the duplication process. And it's like they're thinking. It's like they're living beings. I don't know that they're living beings. They could simply be what we would think of as robotic, but they're, they're made out of biological material that information has been coded into them from the outside. And that's how it works in our bodies. We've only just discovered all this in the last 10, 15 years, and now we've got these 3D animated images that the scientists are saying, that's exactly what we're seeing in our microscope. That's exactly what we're seeing. And I show it, and I show it, and I show it, and I write in my books, and I put in illustrations, and I still talk to people, even in this church, not many, but around the world, and it's all out over the Internet. You just talk to people about it and say, now, what are you talking about? Where, where can I find that again? It's like, man, that should rock your world. God is screaming at us. This is not evolution. It's not a chemical soup pond. You didn't come from a monkey. There's something intelligent and alive, if you will, whatever the definition of life is. Scientists argue over that. But there's something that they're obviously thinking. They know what they're doing. They each have different jobs. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be alive. But that all started with God. Not a meteor exploding in the universe. I, I mean, guys, it's right before us. How, how about the first seven words of the Bible? Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I showed you pictures from the ancient Hebrew language and the, and the letters that were formed in their shapes. And on that verse, only three of the letters had the tav, the last letter that looks like kind of like our T. Only three of them did. And it's perfect shapes of a cross. And there are three of them in that first verse. And in the middle, it's right under the word et, which means the aleph and the ta, the aleph, the alpha and the omega, the beginning, the end. The name God says is his three times in Isaiah. He says it. Jesus says it two or three times in Revelation. And it said in First Peter and, and, and throughout the scriptures, it's Jesus. It's God. And he's the one on the middle cross. In that verse, it's a picture of Golgotha. And if we stopped right there and said, well, that's a strange coincidence. But I've taken you and showed you how that same picture with Jesus on the middle cross is in Psalm 22. It's in Isaiah 52. It's in Isaiah 53. It's in Zechariah 12. All of those are crucifixion prophecies of what's to come. All of them have a picture of Golgotha with Jesus in the middle. Amen. But I talk to people. And they say, now remind me about that again. Now, what is this again? Like, that should change your life. It should rock your world. I understand. I am not comparing myself to Jesus. I'm talking about human nature. I'm a part of human nature too. I forget things. Sometimes I forget to see the significance of things. Sometimes I don't see the significance of it until I do. Then I go, how stupid was I? So I'm not talking down to any of you. I'm just saying... We get on to Peter and Philip and those guys, and we say, how could they say, how could they say, I don't know, how do we say it? How do you guys say it? Because the cares of the world, we're living in Satan's world. I knew a preacher that said that one time. <laughs> we're living in his world. 
That's why we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We've got to stand in the word. We've got to exalt his name. We've got to exalt his word. We've got to exalt what God is showing us before our eyes. He is still working. He's still showing us miracles. He's still, we can see it with our eyes. We can deny it if we want, just like the Pharisees did. How could they have nailed him to a cross with all that they had seen and heard? Because of evil hearts from living in Satan's world, they wanted power and money and wealth and attention on them. So they kept explaining away what God was showing them. We live in the same world. Even people sitting in pews around churches, even pastors and pulpits, we live in the same world. Guys, I'm telling you, if there was ever a time for the church to buck up, strap up our boots, put a square in our shoulders, and understand we are children of the king. We are now the priest and the ambassadors of the coming kingdom. Our feet have been washed in the blood of the lamb. We are a kingdom of priests. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. We are the ones that God's kingdom has called. We are the ones. We are the ones that must bow before him and hang our heads and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I missed that. I'm sorry I didn't see that. I'm sorry I forgot that. It's one of the most important things about you. I... Father, forgive me and keep using it. That's why I prayed that prayer about, Lord, you, 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 you're there. You answer my prayers. You hear my cries for mercy because I know you're Lord, but, some, but sometimes I just don't act like it. That's why I prayed that over you and me. We're living in the most prophetic time since the first coming of Jesus Christ. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago, now you know the context of that whole night and that whole conversation and that context of John 14, verse 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's so beautiful, so beautiful, so powerful to use. But now you understand the emotions behind it, the context of it what they were doing when they did it, what they were saying, what had happened with Judas, what had happened with Peter, what had happened with Thomas, what had happened with Philip before or right after any of all that was said, and then what happened from there. So it all ends in that chapter 13 with Jesus saying, and I'm going to paraphrase, now I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And soon... You will see me again, and then you will know, because I live, you shall live also. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. And three days later, they saw him again. It rocked their world. It changed their lives. And almost all of them went to their deaths, martyred. Proclaiming, They were more assured that he was alive than they were sure that they were alive. <laughs> they, they saw it. They breathed it. They ate it. They smelled it. They touched it. And I'm telling you, God's still doing the same kind of things today. A lot of it's being revealed right before our eyes. The problem is most of people who claim to belong to the Lord do not have eyes to see. I pray that you do. These are important times. Not only do you need to see what's before your eyes, but you need to study it, look at it, talk about it, share it, because it is earth-shattering to those that have eyes to see. Amen. The rest of the world is la, 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 tiptoe through the tulips, just like the days of Noah, just like the days of Lot. We're living in the midst of it. Now, the rest of the decision is ours. I will quote the words of Joshua again. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I pray you do too. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Let me pray with you.